Amen. So we've been talking about holiness in many aspects, that we are holy through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Our behaviour should be the result of our standing and that as we love Jesus, as we are intimate with Jesus, that gives us a behaviour that's holy, that matches what's already inside of us. We can't make ourselves holy, but we can be affected by encounters with God's Holy Spirit. And I think in my own life, there are a few, there are a few times where a few times where God has visited me. The first time that I received Jesus, the first time I went to church, I've been invited to church, but that moment when someone said something to me and it went deep into my spirit and I knew God was speaking to me. It was a holy moment in my life. Have you had those holy moments, those life-changing moments? I call them holy encounters, and they're very powerful in our life. Some of us have had many, but, you know, God, our God is a holy God. He's an awesome, amazing, powerful God, and he visits us. He comes into our lives through someone who has his holy life in them. But in the Old Testament, God would turn up and visit people. And what I want to share with you today is really just some encounters in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, to remind you of who is living inside of you. The holy God, the holy fire of God is inside of you and me. And it's an awesome thing. The Bible says it's actually a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But God looks at us with great and deep love and desire. And he wants us to just trust him. He wants us to rest in him. He wants us to let him lead us with that holy life that's in us. In today's devotion, there's a a writing in there, and it's titled The Fire of God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29 says that we are to serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. This is one of those scriptures in the Bible that tell us what God is. Our God is a consuming fire. What is that? A fire that is consuming? A physical fire? It's a spiritual fire. God is a blazing fire. That is his holiness. In his holiness, he is a fire. And in the presence of God, that fire hits our life. And it is a fire. Holy Spirit has come to baptize us with a fire. It's the fire of God. It's the presence and spirit of God himself. And in his holiness, he is a fire. You won't read a lot of books about that. There's not a lot of books written about that. But there are many, many people that have been touched by that holy fire and they have changed this world and you and I are touched with this fire. This fire dwells within us, lives through us. When you think of fire, fire is actually a life form. It is heat, it is power. The sun is a giant, massive star. It's actually a ball of fire and it releases heat and power. And the Holy Spirit in us, this holy life in us, releases heat and power, heat and power to live in this life. Have you come face to face with the power of God? Have you come face to face with the fire of God? We see the fire of God moving in our churches. We see the presence. Sometimes the fire of God is his actual glory, his tangible, physical, Shekinah glory. That's the same glory that the children of Israel saw in the pillar that led them in the wilderness. It's the same fire that lit the sky up for them while they were camped out for 40 years. That fire is in you. That Holy Spirit is in you. That holy presence of God is inside of us in Christ through his spirit. And we're walking with a God, friends. You are walking with a God, if you've been baptised, who is a consuming fire. And he will consume in your life everything that is not of him. He'll reveal it. He'll refine us through that powerful fire. It's a wonderful thing. We don't always like the heat of the fire, but the fire will produce 
the precious gold. The fire is usually the trouble in our life, the things we don't like that are being burnt up. God uses all sorts of ways to refine us in this holy fire. He has to. Otherwise, he can't dwell in us. We can't have intimacy unless we have an experience with him in that way. You know the story of Moses, the first introduction of Moses in the Bible. He's, he's a shepherd and he's doing his work with the sheep at the back end of the desert and all of a sudden he walks past an actual physical bush that is on fire. It's burning. It's got smoke and flames of fire and it's burning. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 3 and read it. This is where God's holy fire comes in the manifestation of a burning bush. And from that experience, it changes Moses' life forever. In chapter 3, verses 3 to 5, Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of that bush and he said, Moses, Moses, here I am. And then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. And there's a few things about this story I want to point out. In verse 3, first of all, Moses was turning because you have to turn aside from your life in order to experience the fire of God. When the fire of God is in front of you, if a burning bush is in front of you and you walk past, you're going to miss out. And I, th I see this is what happens. God sends Christians to us. He sends people to us. They are a burning bush. They are there sent by God. And there through them, God will speak to them. They're on fire. They have a fire. They have the power of life in them. They have the heat, the presence of God. We're like the burning bush for people. But if the person doesn't turn aside to come and actually see why this bush is burning, why this person has this passion, they have this fire in them, they'll miss out on it. And just like God called Moses in that fire, God can use you to call someone. And I think we don't realize how much power, how much effect, how much fire in us can actually cause someone else to hear God and see God and inquire, what is this fire? What is this burning bush? We have to sometimes in our life turn away because we have let the fire come down. It's still there. The Holy Spirit's still with us, but we're not burning like we should. We're not burning as God desires us to be. When we know we're not. I've had that many times in my life. And the only way to get back to that burning on fire state is to hear what God has to say. And he will tell you what you need to hear. He will speak to you from that place. But we have to turn aside from our distractions, turn aside from our busyness, turn aside from the very thing that might be taking away that opportunity for that presence encounter with God. Moses, out of the bush, suddenly is standing on holy ground and God tells him, take your sandals off. You are standing on holy ground, the angel says through God. And that holy ground, anywhere where God is, becomes holy. Anything that God touches becomes holy. We've heard a lot of teaching about this, but, you know, everything that God has contact with has to be holy, made holy, otherwise it will be consumed. God cannot coexist with something unholy. That's why you and I have to be made holy through baptism, through Christ, and dying a death it's not a physical death. It's a spiritual death. We die and we rise up now holy, clean, ready to be filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit. But Moses turned aside. And you need to turn aside and hear what God has to say. 
You need to turn aside. It's what Jesus said, the secret place is turning aside. It's going into the holy of holies. You know, when we describe our God who sits on a holy mountain, if you've ever read anything on holiness, you'll know. He sits on a holy mountain. He's surrounded by the cherubim that are fire angels. They're fire beings. They're on fire. They're flaming spirits, the Bible says. The angelic hosts are fire, the ones that are around the throne of God. And here we see in this encounter with the fire a life-changing moment. And I really believe that when a person has come into contact, had an encounter with the Holy Spirit in a fire moment, their life will never be the same. And, you know, Moses didn't want to do what God said. Moses couldn't even speak. He was not a man who could speak properly. He had a stutter. He did not want to become the greatest prophet next to Jesus Christ, but he did. But it all started at that burning bush experience. And so often in our life, it's that burning bush experience, that encounter in our bedroom. I've read stories of people that had encounters with the Holy Spirit in their bedrooms, people like Catherine Kuhlman. Catherine Kuhlman was called of God through a fire experience in her bedroom. Benny Hinn, the same. And you know what happens? What happens? Like us, we have to, like Moses, take off our sandals, take off our self, our humanity, and bow before our God. In those moments, we have to surrender. And I think a moment in contact with his holiness, we, we can't but submit to him because it's so overpowering. That's what's kept me in ministry. I have to tell you this. The only thing that has kept me faithful to my husband, the only thing that has kept me from caring what this word says and calling me to live by it is the fire of God. It is the only thing that keeps me. It is the only reason I get up in the morning. It is the only reason I choose to follow Jesus with my life. Because let's face it, there are many things you can do with your life. There's many things I could do. But if God visits your life, and when he visited me as a young woman in addiction, in brokenness, I was in a desperate place, but I knew it was holy. I knew it was a holy moment in my life. And a couple of other visitations, and I don't know about you, but in those visitations, I felt I needed to submit to Jesus more. If I could have melted into the ground, I would have. That's how much you want to just in that moment give everything that you have. And I believe God is calling us in this church to that place again. If you're not there, if you've lost, you've been distracted from it, he's calling you to a place of total surrender, a place of total surrender to himself. That's what the fire deserves. That's what the fire, it's, it's scary, but when you step into the fire, you'll be like those three Hebrew boys that went into a fire and they saw the fourth person standing there, the son of God himself. In the fire. The fire is designed to change you. The holiness of God that we've been learning about, this doctrine is about you living in the power of that fire. It's not the knowledge of you being holy. It's the power to live out that holiness. But it won't happen unless you submit to that fire. The process of the fire. Moses had to submit and take his sandals off in that moment to stand before God. And he's one of the few people in the Bible that got to have conversations with God. He went on the holy mountain and saw the backside of God's own being. How amazing that encounter would have been. In Exodus chapter 24, Moses actually sees the glory of the Lord. You can read this at home, but when Moses went on the mountain with God, 
his experience up there. God says, come up to me on the mountain and I'm going to give you the tablets of stone, the commandments. And he went up there and a cloud covered the mountain. And verse 16 says, and the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai. That's the holiness of God. And on that cloud, it covered it for six days. He was up there for six days. And on the seventh day, the seventh being the perfection, the seventh day, God called Moses into the midst and he said, come into the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire. There it is again. God let him come into this experience, into the consuming fire on the top of the mountain. So what I'm saying today to you is that every time you get on your face, every time you have that time to set aside, to be with God, you are dealing with a holy God, a consuming fire. There's things he wants to burn. He sometimes in the fire, you know, he's, he's actually heating you up. On a cold day when you stand in front of a fire, it is so warming. It is so luxurious. That's what he does in his presence. If you've got, who's got a fireplace? How good was your winter? There is something very powerful that we as human beings like about a fire. It warms us. So it's not just an awesome thing to terrify us, although it can be terrifying. Terrifying in the sense to your flesh, it is terrifying. But the fire warms us. The fire gives us comfort and strength and warmth. And we feel good in our spirit when we've been with God. Moses certainly was completely changed by his experience and encounter with the fire of God, this holy fire of God. And this is what we have inside of us through our baptisms, through being baptized into Christ. Now let's look at Isaiah's experience, the prophet Isaiah, the great, I call him, he's like the St. Paul of the Old Testament. He had more prophecies come to him more spoken about him than any other prophet. And also, Jesus quoted him more than any. And we see in his encounter, if we read it, let's read Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now imagine this with your imagination. This is an encounter with holiness, with a holy God. He sees the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of the robe filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wing, wings. Two he covered his face. Two he covered his feet. With two he flew. And one cried out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And so I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, your sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, send me. Here's a completely different person having a different encounter again with this fire, again with the holiness of God. It's the most dramatic revelation, I think, of God's holiness. We get to see what this man saw in the spirit. And it's not unlike the same spiritual experience John saw in the book of Revelation we read about. They describe very similar experiences. But this one is so dramatic. This is a close encounter with God. And he's in a place of desperate mourning over his uncle, uh, his cousin, who the reason that his cousin, you probably know this, but his cousin did something he shouldn't have done. 
He performed a sacrifice that he shouldn't have done his way. He took things into his own hands and he was struck with leprosy. And so he's mourning over this. You know, the holiness of God struck him because he'd lost reverence for the things of God. That's what happens with the fire, with the awesomeness of God. You can't abuse that. And that's what happened to this man. And when he sees the Lord, imagine this incredible picture. He's right up there. He sees this high lifted up presence of God at the top. And he sees the train, like the wedding trail of a train of a beautiful wedding gown. I imagine it to be just really light and white and fluffy and huge. So he sees God at the top and this train coming down and it's literally filling up the rest of the temple. It is the beautiful train, the clothing of what God is wearing on the throne, our holy God. And in this vision, he sees the angels, the seraphim. And that word literally means burning ones. They are burning and on fire around the throne and they are covering their eyes. They're covering themselves because they cannot look just plainly and boldly like you and I can at the very throne of God, at the presence of God himself. And they are calling out because the holiness of God is so bright. They are calling out continually saying, holy, 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 holy. They can't stop saying it. Because that's what perfectly in one word, in one word completely describes and says everything about who God is. That's, that's it. That is the one thing that completely, perfectly describes our God, the one who lives in you. He is just holy, 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 and they cannot stop saying it. They are in awe of his holiness. Now, of course, God is full of love and he's full of power and he's full of life. But the thing that makes him full of love and mercy and life is his holiness. It is that he in himself, the essence of who he is, is holy. That's why if we don't get this right, if we don't understand holy God, a holy fire, a holy being is in us. Christ himself, the Holy One, came, put on flesh, died for our sin. A holy God came and exchanged himself in our place so that you too could be holy, could live out from this power and presence of his beautiful holiness that's why our hands must be clean, our lips must be clean, our mind must be clean. And it comes from a revelation, an encounter with his spirit to be able to then live this out, to make those healthy choices, to make those sacred choices, to be pure. Because you know what that word means? Holiness, holy. It means sacred. It means pure. It means faultless, flawless, untainted, unstained. That's who we are now in Christ. That's who lives in you. The holy, holy one. And so Isaiah is getting this experience with the holiness of God. And he sees these burning angels, these burning ones, in amazement, in shock, amazement, continually saying. And it brings to mind, some of you will remember a message, which one day I hope I will have the blessing. I hope one day I can put a book together of some of the greatest messages that have been preached in this in this ministry. But one message that Peter preached on holy, holy, holy. And he said, you know, in your day-to-day -day life, just step into that presence right there, you're right into where the angels are crying out, holy, holy, holy. In your trouble, in your pressure, in your terrible, desperate crying out to God, just step into holy, holy, holy. Join the angels. Holy, holy, holy. I just got the worst news of my life. Holy, holy, holy. I've just stepped in. I've just stepped into that presence. I've just stepped in into the most uncorruptible, perfect place I can be right now 
in my life. Well, you're carrying that. Because he lives in us, we can actually carry his presence and move into that realm any time. It's so beautiful. It's so powerful. He also sees these angels calling and he sees the doors shaking and trembling. The, tor- the doors of the temple shaking and trembling because of the voice and the sound. It's the same trembling, I think, and the sound that the book of Acts, Pentecost, this is just my thinking, but the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came down in the awesome first time outpouring of the Spirit in Pentecost, it was this amazing trembling and sound. They heard the sound of a mighty rushing wind and there was a shaking going on. The whole building, they shook themselves. So this holiness, when we encounter this holiness, whoever we are, often our first response to God is not going to be how much you love him. When you first encounter the holiness of God, your first response will be the awareness of your own condition. You are aware. And Isaiah was immediately aware of his unclean lips. You'll notice in the story when John Sorry, when Jesus calls the fishermen and they catch their fish, it's the first time he's met Peter. Peter says, I am a man of unclean lips. In a way, he was saying, Jesus, don't look at me. I'm so unholy. And that's where we were. All of us were like that once. We can all identify and say, I was so unholy. It's the conviction of the Holy Spirit that shows us our need to be holy. Our need to be loved comes out of our need to be holy. Did you know? Because if we've been created in the very image of God, the first thing we need is to be made holy. Then we can receive his love. Then we can receive that grace. Then we can receive all that he has for us. But we cannot hear God call us like Moses, like Isaiah, until we realize that we're in the presence of God. And when we encounter holiness, he calls us. He calls us. He calls you to give your life. He calls you to give yourself to follow him and live like a Christian. Do you know churches are supposed to be filled with people that live this life? Not some, but live as a Christian and be prepared to die We're living in days in the Western church where we are so afraid to talk about heaven, hell, any judgment, no judgment. But the problem is we're not preparing people for eternity. My fear is that a lot of people think that they're okay, but they're not. Because they've never, ever really come under that conviction to be made holy. And so they don't commit to the baptized life. They don't commit to living a holy standard. Now, you're not right by your holy standard, but if I didn't live in a faithfulness toward my husband, how long is my marriage going to last? The commitment, the covenant, requires a commitment of faithfulness. And that's why I think Jesus said, when I come back on this earth, will I find any faith? People that are faithful, people that are walking in this holiness, living a holy life. The blood-bought church that Jesus is coming for, which I've mentioned many times, it's a pure and unblemished, spotless church. And so we have to work out in our own lives, under fear and trembling if necessary, which has happened to me, what what is okay and what is not okay. When you're going out with a guy or a girl, as a Christian, there is a holy way you conduct yourself. When you're in a marriage, there's a holy way to speak to your husband, to your wife. When you're in business, there's a holy way. And Neil put it really well. Pastor Neil put it really well in a recent message, which I've watched a few times because I got so much out of it, position and condition. And he says here, 
If you run your marriage the holy way, you're going to have the best marriage. If you run your business the holy way, you're going to have the best business. If you run your life in a holy way, you're going to have the best life possible. Because holy life, holy is the best part of God. It's the essence of who he is. Have you had an amazing encounter? Have you had that sense of I'm completely undone? I'm completely undone in this moment because the Holy Spirit is in this room, in this moment, maybe in the service here. He wants to cleanse us. Even this morning, you might think, I need to be cleansed again. I need to be just washed again. As you believe in Jesus, as you take communion, as you feed, he's washing you. He's cleansing you. The devil does not want you to live out a holy life. He wants to be in your world. He wants to control you. He wants to filter your thinking because he can access that so that you will think unholy, that you won't believe that you're holy. He wants to separate you from this holy life and the holy calling. Do you know if God called you in your life, if God has called you, it is the most holy calling. It is the most holy thing. What has he called you to? That was a holy calling from God himself, just like Moses heard, just like Isaiah had. Isaiah gets to hear the boardroom of heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit planning a mission. He gets to hear it. He was a human man like you. Through that holy experience. And that's what God wants to do. Maybe you haven't had that experience then seek it. Seek it. And as you, as you come into this holiness, another thing that happens in our life through these encounters, we change. We change. We're made more like Jesus. In other words, we're made more holy. Now, we're not saved by that conduct. However, we do glorify God through that. We do glorify God because God is seen. and We become the burning bush for people. We become the missionary. We become the voice that proclaims the gospel to our work friends. This is what God designed in Christ. Another encounter with holiness was when Christ was actually conceived in the body of Mary. In Luke chapter 1, verse 35, it says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And here the angel tells Mary, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. You're going to have a divine, holy experience. And inside of you, God would then place the life of Christ, the holy life of Christ in heaven would be put in her body. This was one of the most dramatic, incredible miracles of all time. Max Lucado describes it like this, and I've used it before in my own writings and things because I love it. Divinity arrived. A spectacular holy thing happened in that one particular moment. God became man. While the creatures of the earth walked unaware, divinity arrived. Heaven opened and the Holy Spirit placed the holiness of God in a human womb. The omnipotent in one instant made himself breakable. He who had been spirit became pierceable. He who was larger than the universe became an embryo. He who sustains the world with a word chose to become dependent upon the nourishment of a young girl. God as a fetus. Holiness sleeping in a womb. The creator of life being created. God was given eyebrows, elbows, two kidneys and a spleen. He stretched against the walls and he floated in amniotic fluids of his mother. The holiness of God dwelling in that woman, Mary. Amazing. There's lots of encounters in the book of Acts, and they are fearful things. Ananias and Sapphira, they came in contact with the holiness of God and dropped dead because they deceived 
the Holy Spirit and that holy power in the early church of men and women coming, giving their life, selling all that they had and bringing it to the feet of the apostles. That's what they did when they got converted. When the fire of God touched their life, they all came and they did this. That power, that commitment, that fire. Ananias and Sapphira tried to buy their way in and it offended the holy fire of God and they dropped dead. You don't mess with this fire. It is a fire. Holiness is a life. It's a force. It's not a teaching. It's an experience. It is God himself living and dwelling inside of us. And when we're in contact with this holiness in our lives, we cannot, we cannot stay the same. His presence has to take over our life. His glory which is called the matchless Shekinah glory, which we've had visitations of, even recently, a few weeks ago in church, where the glory of God was in this building, the tangible, beautiful presence of God himself, where I never wanted it to leave, I never wanted it to stop, that sort of glory. That's the heavenly glory. That's the Holy Spirit bringing visitations. And I say, why is he doing it? And how can we keep him doing it? By thirsting and hungering after this. By seeking to love God, to live fully committed to him. By yearning and passionately seeking him. He's a holy God. He deserves the highest place. He deserves our heart. He deserves this life that you have to live it out the way he wants because he's holy. His holy life in you is a gift that you received at your baptism. If you haven't been baptised, that's what you must do, my friend. Be baptised, repent of your sin, be baptised into the life of Jesus so he can put his holy fire inside of you. And from there, he will lead you. And as you feed, you'll be fanning the flame of the fire. As you take communion, as we heard from Pastor Ryan so powerfully, as you eat of the life of Christ, you share in his death, you share in his life, you proclaim the power of who he is in your life, you will get stronger. As you fellowship, you will burn. And just like a coal, when you join in that fellowship, that coal gets heated up and stays hot. When you pull that coal aside, it burns out eventually. We can't be apart from the fellowship, from the communion, from the word of God and still stay on fire. In the devotion today, take it home and read it. But there are four things I think that kill the fire of God in our life. One, number one, is offence. It is the first thing that will destroy the Holy Spirit fire in us. It's being offended. We must release, relinquish, renounce offence. We have to forgive. It's a choice of our will. And again, if we are in touch with this holy God, we will forgive. We will forgive because we want to be forgiven. We'll submit that fire calls us to forgive. The second thing is disappointment. When you are just so deeply disappointed with your lot, life has not turned out the way you wanted. And I deal with this a lot in counselling, how much disappointment I hear. I then have to go and wash my mind, my robes, from the disappointment in people's lives. Honestly, I want to smash my head because it's so hard and so tough for some people. But the disappointment can destroy and discourage us. And we've got to stop that from happening. Again, it's a choice of our will. It's to look at the great things that God has done in your life. You beat disappointment through praise, through worship, through telling God, I am grateful. Do whatever you have to every day to remind yourself how grateful, how good your life is. And being thankful to God for what you have. That will keep your fire going. That will keep you burning for Jesus. The other thing is materialism. Watch out. Materialism will steal the fire of God. It will. You start lusting. You start following. And it comes to me too, believe me, the idea of having money and having more money than you need is so enticing. 
We all want money. We all need money. But we need God first. We need God's blessing on our money, and we've got to watch ourselves. Because how often have men and women stopped serving God because of money, materialism? Materialism will keep us from obeying God, listening to God, and serving God. It's the number one reason people resign from ministry life because of materialism. And the last one is being busy. Too busy for God, you lose your fire. If you are too busy to spend time alone with God, and that's one of the ways that you know that you really do have a fire relationship, a fire Holy Spirit experience with God, and you're having encounters with the Holy Spirit, is because you've got time. You spend time with him. You're not just living in a house with someone. You are living in the bedroom, in the intimacy of that relationship. A marriage is not two people living in a house sharing a life together. A marriage is an intimate merging of the two of you becoming one. One heart, one mind. And you can have, in holy marriage, you can have a relationship that is really powerful, effective, productive, fruitful. That's what happens in the intimacy, in our relationship with God. So this fire, go for it. Feed it, fuel it. But remember, you are carrying the fire. Those encounters you have with the Holy Spirit are very powerful and precious. And you are a fire. You are a fire in God, walking around like a burning bush. Let people see and inquire of Jesus and be touched with that holy fire in you. Amen. Thank you for listening and God bless.